the mix and was like nodding. And then I realized, oh my gosh, maybe may, I might be good at this. And more importantly, whether I was good or not, in that moment, um, it instilled a confidence with me, which led me to then start the podcast, which then led me to start creating content, which then led me to help like start my own little label thing and help a, a dozen uh, like artists and like really make a much bigger, faster impact on the world and, and seek out and execute on what I was originally wanting to do, which is help people through music. And man. It was it was an absolutely life changing experience in that moment. So cool. I, I feel like you already had some sort of tendency to not be afraid, you know, just to open up a you know a commercial recording studio while in college and put in those kind of hours. That's not like uh, that doesn't strike me as somebody who has imposter syndrome. That strikes me as somebody who is who is just going for it. Absolutely. Uh, I, I do think know? that that imposter syndrome or that like insecurity was developed when I started to learn that there's a lot more to know. Like, I think at the beginning stages right. of starting when you're naive. Studio, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, it was when the naivety, like, kind of removed that veil, like, removed from my face, and then I realized, oh, shit, like, there's really awesome engineers out there. There's a lot to learn. <laughs> yeah, to say the least. So, so, so these days, you're, you're mostly mixing, or you're, or, or you're doing some... Or, what, how's your time, like, I guess, split or spent? Yeah, so I'm definitely mostly a mixer. By, uh, and I have mixes and stuff to do every day, which is funny. I'm a mixer, but most of my commercial work, um, I do a lot of mastering, actually. I don't promote myself as a mastering engineer, but I do a lot of label commercial work for as a mastering engineer, which is surprising. That's a whole other story in its own, but um, I would mostly do mixing. Um, obviously, I create content and stream on Twitch and make the podcast, which is a source of income as well. Um, I own a commercial recording studio out here. Um, in Utah, anywhere outside of a major music city, is usually the studio is owned by the engineer, right? That's more common, right? But out here, it's a commercial facility. The owner is separate from the engineer. So I kind of, and it's easier, like, talk about financially. I'd rather make, fi like, passive income, not having to engineer a single session. I, I love engineering, right? And I'm good at it, but... I mean, come on, like money for free, <laughs> no time spent. Like that sounds like the dream. So um, we have, I've built a lot of like systems out here. I'm a big systems person, built a lot of mm -hmm. systems, manuals to kind of train interns, volunteers, um, and uh, engineers to basically pitch to our clients. So we help people make money and we make money passively. We have, I have a business partner named Lou, who's amazing. He's your, he's the co-host on your podcast as well. Yes, he, right? he is. Absolutely. And so that's kind of what we're doing out there. So like I record every once in a while. Um, but I'm mostly just owning and I, I do mixing for my income. And you mix from your, from your home studio. I mean, it looks like to me. Yeah. So we got the commercial spaces thinking that we would use them during the downtime when there weren't any sessions and then we would mix cause Lou does a lot of like post-production work as well. Mm. Um, and we're like, okay, we're going to mix. And, but it, the studios, fortunately, unfortunately, fortunate, definitely fortunately, we, we got so busy that we had to look for offices elsewhere so Lou just recently opened up an office in the same building just down the hall a personal space and I've kind of decked out my own uh, an extra bedroom in, in my apartment um, which works out really really well and uh, we still leave most of our equipment in the studios for people to use and and it's actually been quite a blessing to say the least a great place to store your your gear and uh, let other people rent it out absolutely awesome Hey everyone, if you're using Dropbox or Google Drive to send your clients their music, let's talk about how you can supercharge your studio's workflow with one collaboration tool called FilePass. Here are just a few ways that FilePass can help you collaborate with your clients. First, your clients can leave their timestamp feedback directly in FilePass from any device while they're listening to their music. Second, their comments turn into a tidy to-do list for you. Simply mark each comment as done while doing revisions. Third, all your hard work is protected using their download paywall. This means the artists you work with can't download their files until they've paid in full. Finally, FilePass makes collecting massive files easy. Just send an upload link to your client and they can upload files as large as one terabyte directly into their project without needing their own FilePass account. As a Secret Sonics listener, you can get 20% off your first year of FilePass by going to filepass.com slash secretsonics and there's a link for it in the show notes below, so go check it out. All right, back to the episode. So, so tell me a bit about, you know, how work comes your way. I'm, you know, I'm sure people are finding out, finding out about your services through the podcast, word of mouth, former clients. How, how do people find you? Yeah, this is where I will have to admit a mistake of mine. And, and I, don't, I wouldn't say it's a mistake, but I think it could have been better planned. And, and I'm trying to readjust. 
uh, you shouldn't make content or promote your services to your peers, right? So I made what's called <laughs> right. the Mixing Music Podcast, and other mixers are not my clients. <laughs> you know? So I'm, I'm kind of making content for my peers. And, and granted, I've kind of curated the content to be more for producers and songwriters and artists that are recording themselves. So it's kind of balanced out. But I would still say most of my work is from people that know me personally and word of mouth. I, ha- I do have a couple clients. And granted, like I have almost half a million downloads. This is no small podcast. But I have most of my clients still come in from people that know me personally. There's very few that actually come in from the podcast. Um, And that's why I emphasize a lot, even on my podcast, about the importance of relationships over quality of of a mix, you know, to a certain degree. No, I I would say for sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, my podcast hasn't brought me any direct work, so to speak. You know what I mean? It's been, but but it has helped me kind of. I don't know, it's given me like a little space on the internet that people say, oh, like, I, I don't want to say authority, but like it, it gives me, it gives you like a, a spot there that people are willing to talk to you. You know, you get in the room with people like it, it still, it still gives you that kind of. No, there's definitely authority. There's a thing that comes with being a podcast host or making, being some sort of content creator that isn't even necessarily the direct work, but the, but the work eventually it dev- does help at the end of the day. Absolutely. Because it gives you that kind of leverage, so to speak. And, and I say this all the time. It's like, I think it's ridiculous that someone would listen to my podcast, especially when I started it so young. And, and granted, I'm still young, but like, um, <laughs> I have no real authority. I didn't grow up in the traditional interning, running, assisting system in, in LA or Nashville or New York. It was, I'm an entrepreneur. <laughs> and I kind of learned this stuff from the, like YouTube and, and from mentors here and there. I think it's silly that people would listen to me talk and feel that I have any sort of authority. And I'm not saying this in an imposter syndrome correct way, but it's like, it goes to show how much power there is in creating content into relaying information. Like I I recommend, that's why I recommend to everyone, like make content or to uh, provide value in any way possible. And let that be part of your learning process. You don't have to know everything, but like, you don't have to say your own thoughts. You can curate content. Like if you, if you're not if you don't know anything about mixing, like you know what's u- equally useful information is not your own opinion about mixing, but like saying, hey, Tony Maserati said this, Jason Joshua said this, Leslie said this, and saying your own opinion and your learning process, that's just equally as important. Um, and I really believe that. Yeah, you don't even necessarily, curating, just like you said, or you could just be one step ahead of the people that you're educating, you know what Absolutely. I mean? Absolutely. As long as you're one step ahead of other people, you can help them. Absolutely. Or at least in some departments. So there's definitely, it's definitely been worth starting a podcast. And there's also a slightly narcissistic tendency, prideful thing that I want to do. I eventually want to go to NAM or AES because I started it and then COVID hit. I want right. to go to NAM or AES and wear like a podcast t shirt and people to like walk up to me and be like, oh, I listened to your podcast. Like, I th- I'm not famous enough or cool enough for that. That's like old. <laughs> Yeah. Like every once like I went to go shopping at Uniqlo for clothes a few months ago mm-hmm. and like the dude that was working there is like, "Oh my gosh, you're DK. I listen to your podcast." And I was like, "This is crazy." Yeah. <laughs> I was like, "This is Mind awesome." Blowing. Like, who who am I for you to listen to? This is wild. <laughs> Man, it's cr- it's it's so crazy to have an impact like that. Like like I I know that like my podcast has led to certain people like, you know, getting work or working with with certain artists, you know, like Somebody I recently had on Mike Tampa. He said, "Yeah, like somebody reached out and like I'm starting to work with a new artist since your you know the podcast episode just dropped." I'm like, "This is crazy! Like this like little thing is like helping other people in like significant ways, and that's just like mind blowing." Yeah, and uh, I'm with you. One day I- I'm gonna get to a Nam, and uh, a lot of people are gonna come say hi. I'm excited for that. Well, the next one that you, we pull up at, I'm gonna say hi to you. We're at least gonna hang out. Yes, let's do it. I, I don't think I can make it to this this coming one, but hopefully maybe the year after or something. Whenever you're ready. Eventually. Yeah, LA hopefully will still be there as long as the world still exists, which is maybe looking doubtful every day, but but, but let's hope. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. I, I, I love, in general, like, last thing about the podcast, like, I love it so much. Like, again, the whole reason why I started doing music was to help others and and I always, I always say that, like, I'm in the business. Mm. Like, I may be a mixer, but I'm really in the business of instilling confidence in people. People come to me, artists come to me, producers come to me feeling insecure about a project. They leave feeling like they're the best damn artist or producer in the world. Like, that's what I mm. want. It's not about the sound. It's about the confidence. So, um, and like that. you said, like, yeah, I love it. That's when so people, important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I love it when people on the Discord, our Discord or whatever, they're like, yo, I got some clients this week because of you. Or like, they listen to my motivational business stuff. 
uh, and they're like, oh my gosh, like I've been feeling insecure and I feel like I've gotten over that. Or like, there's so many, I have people that DM me every single day and it's just like, that's what I do this for. I don't give a shit about the money or the clients. It's more about if I can instill confidence in people, I'm happy. I mean, I think that's like specifically thinking about mastering. Like what, what does a mastering engineer bring? It brings peace of mind, right? The mastering engineer, like to, to quote Sam Moses. And it's, it's totally true. Like, you know, when, when the mastering engineer says the project is done and now you have confidence to put this out, that this is a finalized, complete, you know, record, you know, and, and that, and that's totally true down the chain as well. Like with the mixing engineer say, no, this is your song and this is mixed and it sounds great. And you know, the, you know, the recording engineer saying the same thing. No, that vocal sounded awesome. You know what I mean? And, and, and that kind of, that confidence is so important. And I, and I've, I've been learning just, just working with artists over, over years of just like, the more I'm confident in telling them these things, the better they feel about the product and the better they feel about their art and their music. And you, you know, you got to just be, obviously you have to be, you know, you have to tell it like it is, but you know, you got to give, you got to give them the the strength to, to move on, you know, so to speak. Absolutely. I've definitely, uh, so I didn't really mention this in my life story update, but, um, I, I started a band when I moved to Utah, first moved to Utah. We actually, uh, won a battle of the bands, uh, hosted by iHeartRadio and they, iHeartRadio in collaboration with Republic Records, like they flew us out to LA and paid for a hotel and everything. And we sat down with the biggest A&R, the two of the VPs of A&R for Republic Records and they were thinking about signing, at least me as a singer. Uh, anyway, that went south. Of course, that's like every engineer's producers how did you start your career oh you know i was about to get signed and you know like classic classic starting point but um it was in that moment like they didn't sign me because i didn't have enough confidence and the 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 meeting went sour and i lost the glimmer in their their eyes when it was like i took the humble approach which is really interesting but yeah there's that's all i'm about like it's it's been difficult for me i have a lot of imposter syndrome i don't i've never really called it that but a lot of insecurity um, I have a lot of complexes given to me by my parents, you know, that many other people's have that I've been trying to get over. It's quite scary to make content and to be in front of people, but I'm glad it's been beneficial. Totally. So, so let's talk a little bit about your approach to mixes, because you know, for all the you know, imp- quote unquote, imposter syndrome, your mixes sound freaking awesome. I was listening to a bunch of them before we got on the air. Specifically, like your low end just is always knocking. Yeah, I'd love to, to hear a little bit about you know your approach to mixing music. What's up? Yeah. Let's jump into it. Talk about uh, what's the first thing you do when you get a song? So the first thing that I do when I get a song is usually I myself, most more recently, I have an, uh, an assistant or two that preps my session. And I have a Word doc with exactly how I want it prepped, so like a manual. Um, I've been using folders with the new Pro Tools. It's, it's been awesome. I'm very different in the sense that I do instrumentals first before vocals that may be a little bit different from some other people but weirdest thing that i do is i don't start with drums i start with bass and then i go into drums uh so i I, so what i do is i I kind of put them in folders i mute all the tracks i don't zero out the faders they're like unity whatever the rough mix was i mute every individual track and i unmute them one at a time starting with the bass the 808s um in a combination of chronological order and order of importance just kind of first guess best guess uh, then do kick drum, snare, toms, overheads, blah, 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 blah. Uh, then do like harmonic stuff, keys, guitars, and then any sort of like lead strings, horns, if there is any of that stuff. Um, and then go into vocals, which is my bread and butter. Since I'm a vocalist myself by trade, um, that's definitely where I shine as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's kind of how I do it. Just like one click at a time. I think my biggest secret, which uh, engineers will, just by hearing this, will will feel like they I deserve some less credibility but this is where they pause the podcast yeah and they, 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 I will they mix check a, out yeah I will mix a song as fast as I fucking can so I don't mean to a, am I allowed to swear on your podcast oh f- yeah go for it man <laughs> but like I will mix as fast as we I can like as in like granted I grew up playing first person shooters on PC and like I type at like 110 words per minute. So like, I'm really good at computers, you know, <laughs> like, like I've seen some engineers where like they're scrolling through the plugin list and whatnot. But mm. I'm like, no, like I know what, first off, I know what I have enough experience where like, I feel like an experienced engineer will know what they want and use the tools to get them there. Where like an inexperienced mixer will try to figure out where they can go using the tools that they have. Like, I think that's like a difference. I'm the type of person where like, I already know what I want to do and I already knew the to- know the tools to do there so like I do like the search function just pull everything up kind of dial it in move on to the next track like I'll finish a track with like 100 songs it's not weird for me to do all the leveling the mixing the EQ the compression the bus stuff automation effects delays reverb throws all within 4 hours mastered and done less than 4 hours 
And like, so I'm just blazing fast. The reason why is not because I, not just because I can, but I'm a huge fan of, this is something that Leslie instilled in me too, is, is I'm a huge fan of being inspired. I mean, we all know inspiration is fleeting. 